Well, good morning, Trinity family. Uh, we may have put the clocks back last night uh, and regained an hour. I feel like I've put the clocks back about four or five months. Uh, joining you from my home, um, we got a message yesterday from a friend of ours who we spent some time with last week, uh, well, last weekend actually, who has tested positive this week, having had no symptoms. So uh, Tim and I are self-isolating like good citizens at home this morning. So maybe I can claim the prize for acting out Paul's letters. Uh, I feel like I'm sort of speaking to the church from my uh, little prison at home. But uh, it's great to be able to join you, uh, both those of you that are in church and uh, those of you that are joining us online. And uh, yeah, great to be with you this morning on this sunny day. Um, I hope you've had some good ingredients in your week this week. Uh, our middle son uh, began a new job this week. So we took it up a couple of days to go up to London and uh, plant him in uh, his new home. I'm gonna show you a picture of him. Uh, one of my favorite pictures of him. I don't know if you can see that there. Whoops, wrong way. That's him. And uh, you won't be surprised to know that uh, he didn't look like that as we dropped him on the doorstep in London. Uh, many of you know him, Benj, um, but because if he had done, uh, I doubt he would have been able to get himself to work, let alone get himself dressed. Uh, and obviously it's not, a, it's not a, a great big thing to say, but a lot of growth has happened in his life between when that picture was taken and when we left him on Thursday. And it's a simple, uh, illustration of the fact that God has wired us to grow. You don't need me to tell you that, but God has wired us to grow. Living things grow and growing things change. And we are wired to change physically. Sadly, that kind of physical growth that continues to happen isn't always uh, welcome growth as we sort of move into the second half of our lives. But God has wired us to grow and growing things change. And uh, it would be fair to say that Benj hasn't had an awful lot to do with his physical growth. Uh, you know, he hasn't worked hard to make that physical transformation happen. It's just happened as the clock has passed. Uh, but emotional and spiritual growth, unlike physical growth, they don't happen automatically, do they? You know, we know that, but let's remind ourselves, emotional and spiritual growth don't happen in the same way. God has given us his spirit, uh, that's what he offers us as we begin a relationship with him, his spirit to come and live within us to help us grow. But even with his spirit within us, spiritual growth doesn't happen automatically. We don't grow automatically. I'm not going to know him better. I'm not going to be able to love others more. I'm not going to be more connected to him at this time next year, uh, just because the clock has passed. Spiritual and emotional growth requires intentionality. And so I'm not going to end up with more joy or more uh, peace or less fear or uh, less anxiety or more courage. And I'm not going to become more secure in the love of God if I don't have some intentional practices in my life, which is why we've been thinking about this, um, this notion of a rule of life over the last uh, few weeks as a church. For those of you that are joining us for the first time this morning, we've been digging into uh, some different things, some different areas of our lives in order to encourage us to develop a rule of life, a kind of, to collect as it were, to decide on and collect a set of spiritual habits that will help us to grow, that will help us to grow closer to God and that will help us to love him more and that will help him to love others better. And uh, to help us think about this stuff, we've been looking at some material uh, and some principles by a chap called, or um, they're not new, but he's gathered them together uh, in a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, a chap called Peter Scazzaro. Nick put up a slide last week uh, identifying the four areas that we've been looking at. Um, work and activity is coming next week. We're looking at relationships. We looked at them last week and this week, and we began with prayer and scripture, and we've looked at rest. And uh, we're, we're hoping, we're, in, we're trying to encourage ourselves, aren't we, to pick some practices and habits from each of these areas, maybe one or two, that are going to help us move forward in our journey with God. Because let's remember, church, that the motivation 
for thinking about these practices and deciding on them and putting them into our lives is to help us get closer to God. Connection and intimacy with God is the goal. Uh, and so we're going to look, as I said, at relationships again this morning. Nick, Nick kicked us off last week looking at friendship. I'm going to dig into uh, the other areas that Peter Scazzaro encourages us to look at. But first of all, if you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to open it up. There isn't a PowerPoint this morning because I don't have a PowerPoint in my room, but you can find it in Matthew chapter 22, some very well-known, possibly some of the most well-known verses uh, in the Bible, Jesus having a conversation with the Pharisees. And uh, picking up at verse 34, uh, the text says this, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they've been having this sort of uh, conversation, they met together to question him again. They were always being confounded by Jesus's responses to them. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. And he said this, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied this, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. All your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And a second is equally important. Love your neighbour as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. And I love this because Jesus boils the gospel he boils the mandate of the kingdom down into this incredibly simple statement, two simple things. And I don't know about you, but I need reminding about this over and over again, because life can become so complicated. And actually, I think sometimes we can make the gospel more complicated than it is. Jesus says, do you know what? If you want to summarise what I'm about, what I'm calling to you, uh, the life I'm calling you to, what my kingdom is about, you can summarise it like this. Love the Lord your God with all of you, with all of you, and love others to. And that means this. Whatever else we do with our lives, whatever other ambitions I have, whatever other dreams and desires you're pursuing, whatever talents you have, whatever opportunities you have, our capacity to love, our capacity to love others and our willingness to do so and our willingness and our capacity to love God are what count the most in the kingdom. When we stand before Jesus uh, on judgment day, when I stand before him, he's not going to ask me how I changed the world. He's going to ask me, Hans, how did you love? How did you love me? Did you love me? How did you love me? How did you love others? Did you grow in your capacity to love? What did you do with the way I loved you? Did you receive my love? Did you pass it on? And how did you commit to doing that? So when we think about our spiritual practices, of course, we need to wrestle with the practices that relate to relationships because one of the ways that we love God is to love others. Now that's one of the ways that we express our love to God. And so therefore how we commit to learning to love others, how we commit to practicing loving others, how we commit to developing our capacity to love really, really matters. And that happens through real life relationships. It happens in real life. So I wonder this morning whether you see yourself as somebody kind of wearing L plates in your journey of, of loving. Do you see uh, following Jesus as really an invitation from him to journey, journey into learning to love? So what I want to do in uh, the time that we've got together this morning is just to break this down into a couple of areas that Peter Scassero uh, encourages us to look at so that we can think about some of the practices or habits that we might want to pull into uh, our own rule of life, our own sort of um, decision about how we want to position ourselves to grow in our walk with the Lord. Uh, I want to look at a couple of areas to help us do that. And the first one is this, the area of our emotional health, the, the area of your uh, emotional health. Um, I don't know who said it, I can't remember who said it, but you'll know that you'll know the famous quote, no man is an island. It's not in the Bible, uh, but I think there's a lot of truth in it. We've all been created, haven't we, for um, connection and community. And I don't know about you, but I think the last six months has just highlighted that more clearly than ever. We need community. We need connection. We need relationship, which means that our emotional internal world is intrinsically connected to our external 
relational world, for better or for worse. Uh, I bring all of who I am into my relationships and so do you. And therefore my internal world affects my ability to love others. It affects my ability to love you and your internal world uh, it affects your ability to love others in your world and to love me. It's a bit like saying that the state of my house uh, affects my ability to be hospitable. Uh, my uh, daughter was saying to me yesterday that uh, she was just kind of ruminating on the fact that she couldn't have some friends over. She needed to meet them and go out and meet them for a walk because her, her flat was such a mess. You know, the state of our homes often affect our ability to be hospitable and uh, the state of our hearts affects the ability that we have to love others. Uh, so if I don't get any sleep, uh, I'm so sorry, Karis, that you lost your hour of extra sleep last night. If I don't get any sleep, uh, it affects my family relationships. I'm terrible if I don't have much sleep. If I'm really anxious about something, uh, if, I'm, if I'm sort of wrestling with uh, concern, fear, anxiety or whatever, it shows up in my family life. They'll, they'll confirm that to you. It affects my ability to listen to them. It affects my ability to love them. If I'm angry with my parents or if I'm angry with God, uh, it shows up in my friendships. I bring that into my friendships. I can't help it really. If I'm running from a wound in my childhood, uh, that affects the community that I'm part of. I can't help it affecting it because we bring who we are to our relationships. And the invitation of Jesus is to come to him and with his help, and with the help of our community to bring our pain, to bring our brokenness, to bring the losses that we've experienced in life, to bring our sin and to work it out with him, to allow it to come to the surface, to allow him to bring it to the surface so that he can heal with it, heal it, he can deal with it, and so that our hearts can grow as a result of the process. But, but for many of us, I'm sure we'd all agree, that's not where we love to go. You know, our temptation can so often be to ignore or to avoid those kind of emotions, to deny them, to bury them, to push them down. Things like fear or pain, grief, sadness, anger, whatever. And yet we see in the Bible, I love the Psalms. Tim and I read a Psalm every morning. And one of the reasons we love them is because they're raw honesty alongside trust and faith. And we see in the Psalms, we see in the Gospels with the characters that Jesus met. We see even in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus wrestles with his own pain before the Father. We see people who are willing to wrestle with their emotions before God. And uh, God invites us to bring all of who we are into our relationship with him so that our hearts can be healthy. And so we're offering healthy hearts and a capacity to love, a healthy capacity to love to others. Uh, a very small example of this, a number of years ago, many years ago, um, my youngest son was involved in a horrible accident with boiling water. It was very traumatic. Um, he ended up in hospital and uh, I won't go into the details, but the following day was a Sunday and uh, the crisis had been sort of averted and the initial parts of it were dealt with. And I rocked up in church and uh, I knew that uh, my heart can become like a hoover bag that never gets emptied. It's like, it's like I don't sort of bring my stuff to God and I felt fine and I was enjoying the worship I was enjoying being with other people I was enjoying uh, being with the church family you know listening to the word allowing God to speak to me but at the end I kind of thought Lord I don't want to go away I don't want to leave this place with this with any kind of, of the stuff of the trauma the fear the pain of what happened yesterday even though I don't feel it so I decided to go to the front I got somebody to pray for me and I just stood there and I said to the Holy Spirit I said if there's anything in my heart from yesterday that actually I'm going to be taking forward into life because it was such a big deal. I want you to deal with it. And as I stood there feeling totally fine, I just began to sob and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed probably for about 10 minutes. And it was like God taking this bucket and just emptying out uh, the, the impact and the trauma of the day before. And, I, and, you know, the girl praying for me kept praying and, you know, I ended up so stopping sobbing and then I felt fine and I left church and, and I went home with a lighter heart. And I know that it was God's heart for me to leave that stuff with him so that it wasn't cluttering up my capacity to love him and to love others. And if we feel that spending time looking at our emotions or, or giving them room in our lives and processing pain and processing loss and stuff like that is selfish or, or unimportant, please hear today, please look at the Psalms, read the Psalms, know that it is God's heart for you to bring your heart to him. 
if the ultimate purpose of the gospel is transformation, then God wants to transform all of us, which includes the deepest parts of us. So don't deny your losses. Don't refuse to face your feelings. Don't refuse to process your pain. Because otherwise, year after year, we become like those Hoover bags that have got too full, or we become less human without realising it, and we get, or we either get stuck, or we become these kind of um, empty shells with smiles on our faces. So, a couple of questions for us this morning. You know, do do we need? Do you need a mentor? Do you need to start journaling about some of the the losses in your life, some of the the really big disappointments in your life that maybe you haven't grieved well or you haven't really come to terms with or you haven't brought before the Lord? Do you need to find a counsellor that would help you work through uh, some of the stuff that might be hidden in that Hoover bag? Do you need to read a book like Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Cazare to help you move forwards towards greater health? As you do a bit of an edit of your relationships, remember your heart. And then the second area is our family relationships. God loves family. He calls himself a father. We've been we've been connecting with our father this morning. He loves family and we all belong to different nuclear families of different shapes and sizes, whatever they look like, and we belong to his family. Hopefully we belong to the expression of his family here in Cheltenham in Trinity. And family relationships are designed to be a source of love for us. They're not always that, they're broken and messy. And when they don't work, they're extremely painful. But they're also where we learn to love, where we learn to love other people, uh, however broken or challenging those relationships may be. And uh, you may have noticed that we tend to pick friends who we get on well with, who are quite like us in many ways. Uh, we love being them, with them and we have a lot in common with them. But God loves throwing us together. He loves us to have friends. Nick was talking about that last week. But he loves throwing us with people uh, together with people who are different from us. Nick was talking about The Chosen last week. I'd love to encourage you to watch it. But if we see in the Gospels, you know, how does Jesus teach his disciples to love? How does he begin to get them you know, on this journey of, of learning to love in a kingdom way? Well, he gathers, doesn't he, a bunch of people who are completely different. Uh, there's a beautiful scene in The Chosen where Simon gets really irritated when Jesus calls Matthew because Simon sort of says, don't you know what he's done? Don't you know what he's like? He's this horrible tax collector who hates and has been oppressing the Jews. But Jesus gathers together a bunch of people that are completely different because he wants them to learn to love each other as differently and then he goes on to teach them about marriage and he says you know I don't like I don't like marriages breaking up I don't like divorce and they're like what that's ridiculous and then he talks about forgiveness when they say how many times should we forgive our brother and he's like well 70 times 7 and they're like that's ridiculous all his lessons about loving are really challenging because he calls us to love people who are different to ourselves including the people in our own families and in our church family and let's just acknowledge that couldn't be more different to the culture that we live in today. You know, that we, there's, a, there's a lot of talk, isn't there, about this cancel culture. And we see shouting matches on social media uh, with, uh, between people who think differently or feel differently or are different. And we are, we are living in a culture that, that almost allows, well, it does allow difference to justify division. It's not how Jesus does it. We're not allowed. He doesn't give us permission to delete from our lives the people that we disagree with or the people that we struggle to love or the people who uh, you know, hurt us or the people that disappoint us or the people that disapprove us. He says to us, I want you to love them. I want to teach you how to love them. And so therefore, He's got us on this journey and the people that we get to practice with are the people in our nuclear families and the people in our church family. And uh, if we're called to love people who are different, in my book, that involves everyone. If you're married, you'll be married to someone who's completely different to you. Tim is very different to me. There's no one like me. There's no one like you. We're all unique. We're all individual, which means everybody around us is different to us to some extent. And the closer the relationship, the greater the commitment, the more we have to work through and the more we are challenged by Jesus to use these relationships to learn to love. Now, I know I'm only scratching the surface. We don't have have long to talk about this, but I want to just 
as a, I encourage you to think about your, your the area of relationships in your life and to think about some of the practices that you might want to pull into uh, your own rule of life, your own decision about what habits you want to pursue to position you uh, to grow, to grow closer to God and to grow in your capacity to love others. I just want to lob out a few kind of questions really in this area of, of family, church family and nuclear family for you to maybe think about or reflect upon during the week uh, as you do a bit of an edit of your relationships. Maybe you might want to sit down with a cup of tea, definitely sit down with the Holy Spirit and think about the different relationships you have in your life and where you might, where the Lord might be encouraging you to put some specific practices in place to help you either invest in those relationships or improve your capacity, grow your capacity to love the people in those relationships. So, so here are just a few questions that might sort of, you know, get the, the processing juices flowing as it were later on this week. Could you get some training? Would it be helpful for you to get some training, like to go on a course or to read a book? to help you begin to relate differently to your parents or your siblings or your spouse. I know at a particular time in my life, I had to do a lot of work on a, on a really challenging family relationship with my father, but actually through it, God, God grew my heart for him. He grew my heart for, for God. I began to understand God's love for me in a different way, but I had to work really hard on, on some forgiveness issues. Uh, are, are there some relationships that you're struggling with that you need to intentionally get some help with to help you uh, begin to grow your capacity to love and to forgive and to grow closer to that person. If you were to examine your communication and your connection with your uh, close set of uh, uh, family and, and church relationships, where would you want to improve either the quantity or the quality of time that you spend with those people? Are there some simple practices that you could just put in place to uh, invest in some of your relationships? Would it be useful to decide on a particular day of the week to make a phone call regularly to a particular family member? How could you grow in your parenting? You know, if you're a parent of either young kids or adult kids, what could you do to grow your capacity? As I say, living things grow, we never stop growing. How could you grow and invest in your relationship with your children? How could you grow and invest in your relationship with your siblings or with your parents? If you're single, what does it look like for you to invest in being single in a healthy way? What does it look like to invest in your relationships with the opposite sex as a single person and your friendships? Would it be helpful for you to learn how to resolve conflict in a more effective way? I don't think that's something that we're particularly good at. As I've said, would it be helpful to you to get some help with working through some forgiveness stuff? Could you learn to, um, I don't know, become a better listener? Could you learn how to share your heart uh, more openly with some of the people in your sort of inner circle? Do you need to learn how to get some help with parenting your kids spiritually? And how could you invest in the relationships that you need to help you on this journey? What's your commitment like to your, to your church family? Are you committed? Are you connected in a way that allows people to speak into your lives and allows you to carry the burdens of others. Just a few, um, you know, a few things to sort of help us to really think or, or get us thinking maybe about where God might be wanting to grow us relationally, both in our capacity, as I've said, to love him and our capacity to love others. Um, it's a huge area, as Nick said last week, and uh, we've, we've just really just dipped our toes in, scratched the surface. There's a lot to think about. But I just want to finish by reminding us, by reminding myself, by reminding you that as we continue to think of, of our own, about our own personal rules of life, let's just remember that we're looking for tools. We're looking to find tools that will help us grow. We want to hone in on relationship practices that are going to help improve our relationships, that are going to help improve what we bring, what I bring to the relationship, not waiting for somebody else to change, but allowing God to grow and change me. And it's not about trying to do everything. It's not about trying to fit everything in, but just identifying something, maybe one thing from each of the areas that we're looking at and putting that into practice, putting that on our list of 
this is what I want to commit to doing in this season. And so I want to encourage you to decide on things that are concrete and that are practical. So we were talking about Sabbath a few weeks ago. I'm going to take Sunday as my Sabbath rather than ideological things like I'm just going to try and relax more. Or I'm going to phone my sister once a week rather than I just want to be a better family member. And as you think about what will help you to grow closer to Jesus and grow your capacity to love him, invite him. Invite him to speak to you. Invite him into your thinking. Invite him into your decision making. And then ask him to give you the strength to put those things that you've decided into practice. I know there's a lot to talk about and a lot to think about, which is why we're doing this journey over this term. And I'm sure we'll continue to do it in the future. But for this week, let's really think about and do a, be sort of committed to doing a bit of an edit on our relationships so that God can speak to us about where he's wanting to grow us.